so one of the things we were asked to reflect on is what we can learn from history. And as this recent book has shown, what you take from history depends very much on what ideological lens you come at it from the first place. I had a birthday recently, and no one bought me this for my birthday. Quite, quite surprised by that. So um, if you go to new towns looking for a failure of big government, looking for why we shouldn't have state-led um, large new towns, then you'll find plenty of evidence to support that view that you held already. So you'll find examples of town centres that are struggling, neighbourhood centres that are problematic, and residential areas that, that aren't doing a, a good job of, of adequately housing and serving the needs of their residents. And those, some of those problems are particularly prominent in some of our new towns outside the, the more prosperous south and east of England. So I've picked examples from Scalmers, Del Runkle and Corby, but if we looked hard enough, we could certainly find examples in our, in our southern new towns as well. Whether we view new towns as a success or failure, I think, depends very much on what we judge success and failure by. And Harlow's master planner, Frederick Gibbard, was aiming to build Florence in Essex. And perhaps he fell short of that ambition of building Florence in Essex. But if that's what you're judged by, then perhaps you will fall short of that. Perhaps you will be a failure. And his, his enthusiasm of sculpture, I think, public art, perhaps, perhaps build into this Florence thing as well. So if you, if you aim for that and you fall short, then, then is that a failure? But is it better than 90% of the other speculative developments being built at the time? That's, that's another question about, about how we judge success and how we build failure. If we look at the residents' own views, then the first residents to move into new towns are almost uniformly enthusiastic about them. So they love the fact they're light, they're modern, they have green space, their children have new schools to go to. And particularly for women, this was a transformative experience. So moving out of overcrowded, often bomb-damaged slum housing in our cities and going to homes that had hot and cold indoor running water, laundry facilities they weren't showing other families. Their family had their own bath room perhaps for the first time. So those made a huge impact on women's ability to, to not be tied to constantly carrying out very, very labour intensive household jobs. And they were often delighted by, by this change and moved to, moved to a post-war new town environment. Where perhaps they fell short and where some of the problems arise is a failure by new towns to see new social trends emerging. So that how we, how we travel is very different. So we've heard already about cycling across a new town. But we've had huge changes in personal mobility. So while there might be aspirations and infrastructure to cycle across a new town, we've had huge increases in car ownership over the length of time since our, our new towns are being planned and built. We've also seen quite a lot of social changes about how our leisure time is spent. So when people were living in, in urban centres in, in the east end of London, a lot of their social activity will be tied around pubs, around clubs, around communal social activities. But with new technologies like the television coming into the home, a lot more of our social life was then within the home and quite, quite family and perhaps quite, quite inward looking. And perhaps the most important social trend for the physical fabric of our new towns has been the, way, the changing way in which we see shopping. So in the 1950s, when some of our first new towns were being built, we were just coming out of rationing, we had shortages of stuff. The idea that shopping would be a leisure activity would be quite an odd thing. Like you, you just built the amount of shopping that you needed. So you went into town, you bought stuff, you came back again. Shopping as a, as a pastime didn't really exist as a thing. Um, so that's, I guess, one of the way, reasons why some of our, our post-war new towns are quite problematic. They were built to meet a functional need to get your amount of groceries, not somewhere you, where you'd particularly like to spend your, your leisure and cultural time. So some of our, our problematic and failing new town centres perform quite poorly against some of the other options. So where where I live in Stevenage, people have lots of other choices about where they shop. They can go, they can go to Cambridge. Similarly, in Basildon, you've got choices to go to Reading. So, and that ties in with some of the things around personal mobility. So people who have money can choose to take the train or drive to other town centres to meet those needs elsewhere, leaving those existing town centres to those that don't have as much money or don't have access to so much personal mobility. We've learned to love a lot of other things from the 1950s. So the 1950s is very on trend for those of you who, who like to be on trend with these things. So we've learned to love a lot of interior design features from the 1950s. We've learned to love fashion from the 1950s, textiles from the 50s, even home baking from the 1950s. But we can't, the same can't be said about architecture. So there isn't a public love and enthusiasm and joy developed by 1950s architecture, which isn't just a reaction against modernism. So we can love the 1930s. As a, as a country, we've started to love and embrace that, um, that Hercule Poirot look of, um, 
of 1930s modernism. This is the Delaware Pavilion, which the local community lovingly fundraised and worked really hard to restore. Despite looking in really bad condition, both on the outside with concrete failure and on the inside with flock wallpaper. So they were able to see behind that really poor um, state of condition of it and see the lovely building underneath it. But the same can't be said of our new towns. So although we see these lovely photographs or beautiful architectural drawings of how lovely, in this case, Basildon looked in drawings and how equally lovely it looks in early photographs, it doesn't look that lovely now. And you could say that about many buildings, that if we didn't maintain or restore or keep up a building for 50 years or 70 years, many buildings and architecture from different periods would look in quite a bad state by that time. And the failure of new towns to, to reinvest and to restore and to maintain their architecture perhaps isn't helped by the fact they're new. So they had a label as being new towns. They don't need any money spent on them because they're new. Why do, you, why do you need to keep investing in them? We need to invest in other places that, that aren't new. So they, they failed to secure a lot of the urban renewal funding that was available in the, the 80s and 90s and early 2000s to, to refresh and reinvigorate places. Sometimes you have to go somewhere else to see your own place differently. And as a, as a resident of Stevenage, I was really struck by the new towns, the new town centres of Rotterdam and Stuttgart. That I suppose I thought there was an inevitability about the post-war architecture being problematic, those town centres declining, them having issues to do with bad architecture. But visiting Rotterdam and Stuttgart with my, my planning students, I saw for the first time that it wasn't inevitable. They don't have to be declining town centres. I guess at a superficial level, part of their success as town centres is they have shops in them where you might want to buy things. So at a fundamental level, that kind of helps. But then you ask kind of why that happens. You know, why is it that, that those town centres actually work? And part of it is perhaps a different, more, more cooperative way of working together. So in Rotterdam, their new town, which looks very, very like the town centre of, um, of, of Harlow or of Stevenage, um, they were under threat by a new shopping centre being built within the town centre. So all of the retailers got together and they all decided collectively to reinvest in their shop fronts, to sort out the, the advertising and the signage, and to make it once again a more attractive and a place of choice and a destination for shoppers. So that kind of collaborative and collective coming together and, and working together to, to improve their new town is, is one of the reasons for success. And that they don't have to be, as, as we have in many cases, pulled down and replaced by what happens to be the architectural fashion of the time. So there, there isn't a necessity to, to bulldoze large swathes of our new town centre and replace them with something that conforms to new urbanist principles. Which perhaps leads me on to identity. And so many towns now are struggling to create an identity. They'll spend lots of money buying in a consultant to tell them how to have an identity. But new towns already have that. So through their public art and through their architecture, they, they already have a sense of identity and sense of place. Some of you might have seen this in The Guardian recently, that um, Eve outside Nando. So Harlow already has that, and it's something which it can build on for its future success. Um, so I am going to take you on a, a whistle-stop tour of some of the ways that we're, we're doing this in, in Harlow. Um, so um, as we've kind of mentioned already, Harlow's sculpture collection um, is, is not just concentrated in the town centre. The sculptures are um, dotted all around uh, in residential areas, uh, inside and outside libraries, parks, GP surgeries. Um, and community centres. Um, to illustrate this, I've got a picture of um, Barbara Hepworth's Contrapuntal Forms, commissioned for the 1951 Festival of Britain. Um, and it's uh, stood in a quiet crescent in an area called um, Glebelands for, for many years. Um, oops, that's a bit early. Um, but uh, it doesn't, it sort of means that um, unless you know exactly what you're looking for, um, you're, you're not, you'll kind of easily miss what makes Harlow so so unique, um, and this is just as true um, for residents as it is for, for visitors. Um, a lot of these sculptures are so tucked away, if you didn't have friends and family that live there, you just, um, you, you wouldn't come across it. Um, so to counter this, the Trust has um, published a, a map for about a decade now, and we're currently redesigning um, uh, for our third edition. Um, and the main change really is that um, the, the previous map gave a really equal weight to all 91 sculptures across the town. Um, and the trails were organised geographically. Um, the, the, the new map will have um, uh, three trails um, that uh, are designed to kind of tell the story of, of Harlow Sculpture Town and how the, how the sculptures came here through, through a number of key pieces. Um, 
So uh, alongside the printed map, we're working on a new visual identity, um, a website, a signage scheme, and a new app. Um, and the app will um, host sort of detailed information about the works that draws on the art history, but also um, about um, the, the kind of uh, the local history as well and the relationships that people have formed with the sculptures over time. Um, so this is just a kind of sneak peek. Um, the typeface was inspired by lettering used on the original signage um, of the 1950s and 60s by the um, now defunct Harlow Metal Company. Um, so, um, founding members of the Harlow Art Trust, like Sir Philip Hendy, who was then the director of the National Gallery, um, facilitated the acquisition of a number of key pieces like um, Eve and like uh, uh, contrapuntal forms. But it was also typical of the Trust um, at this time to purchase student works. So, um, this is a small bronze called Sheep Shearer by the sculptor Ralph Brown. Um, it was commissioned in 1954 when Brown was still a student at the Royal College of Art. Um, and uh, a few years later, the Trust went on to commission him uh, again for a much, much larger piece, um, and both of these have been um, grade two listed uh, within the last decade. Um, so kind of building on this, this history, um, the Trust has run an annual sculpture residency since 2016. Um, uh, the Sculpture Town Artist in Residence is given um, a solo exhibition in the Gibbard Gallery and an opportunity to donate work to the collection. So I'm, what I'm showing you here um, is a work by um, Finn Thompson. Uh, so he was the Trust inaugural participant. His piece is more waiting room, so it's comprised of the, the benches that you see in the sign. Um, uh, and it's obviously um, very closely related to Henry Moore's iconic Harlow family group. Um, this was commissioned in 53, um, and it has been kind of remarkably mobile. I think it's moved about a total of six or seven times. Um, and these are sort of due to fears about vandalism and weathering that were really not unfounded. The, the baby's head has come off twice. Um, so you can see the paving slabs that top the benches, um, and these are a sort of nod to those outdoor locations that it's, it's had. It sort of um, invites people to kind of to sit and contemplate the sculpture, but also suggests that um, you know one or the other, either the viewer or the sculpture, is not going to be there for very long. Um, this is an enormous fit picture of me and our current um, our current artist in residence, Camille Liver. Um, so um, she's given a supported studio in a Gatehouse in the town centre. Um, and uh, she, we're just looking through the products of a zine making workshop that she ran with uh, photography students at Harlow College. Um, and here are those students at Off Print last week. So she took them to, um, uh, to the art publishing fair. Um, she will also run a series of um, workshops across year groups in a Harlow school um, and show the results of that um, at the Gibber Gallery, um, at her show which opens in November. Um, and, okay, yeah, so I'm going to end finally on another student piece. Um, uh, so in 1955, uh, Sally Doig was a young artist studying at Camberwell School of Arts. Um, the Trust asked her to work up a maquette uh, that she made for her degree show. Um, and it's made of cement fondue, which you don't see so much of these days. Um, but uh, in the first half of the 20th century, it was a kind of inexpensive, uh, versatile material to experiment with. Um, and I'm really including this. I mean, it's um, it's a piece that's that's much loved by 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 locals, but it's really been giving the trust jip since since it was cited. Um, its condition, uh, it, it's it's not really uh, the kind of material that you want to keep outside, uh, gathering you know water underneath for, for 70 years. So we've just recently um, uh, embarked on a on a on a conservation program um, and. Uh, we, th th this one is kind of um, at that point between like a restoration. We have to decide really whether it's time, to sort of do not resuscitate or <laughs> kind of do it, keep keep it at all costs. Um, and um, we will be um, exploring these sorts of questions um, at a symposium uh, at uh, Harlow Council um, in, uh, this September called uh, "Still Out There: um, Postal Public Art." Future of post-war public going on? Like, yeah, I did it. Okay, <laughs> um, and uh, that's that's it. <laughs>